Hi, welcome to Town Meeting Television. I'm here today with Dr. Andrea Grayson, and we're going to talk about the sweet tooth dilemma. Um, Andrea Grayson, you're part of the Create Change Collaborative, is that right? Create Change Lab is Create Change Lab. the website, yeah. Um, so Andrea, tell us who you are and how did you come to write a book called The Sweet Tooth Dilemma? Well, uh, I do a lot of different kinds of things, um, mostly around public health communications in the past decade or so. Um, and back in 2016, I was researching a book about the role of advertising and policy in creating a culture that contributes to poor heating, fast food, highly processed foods. It's all all normalized in media and it, through influencers and you know through after 60 years of advertising people think cereal for breakfast is normal and it's actually the worst possible thing you could eat for breakfast so I was deep into looking at um, policy and cultural themes uh, when almost by accident I discovered that I had my own sugar addiction which I was in complete denial of and um, it all came to a head one day I was in the health food store and I was done with my shopping and I was looking for something to eat on the car ride home which was a bad habit uh, but on this day I, as I was reaching for the dark chocolate peanut butter cups uh, I had a thought I heard a voice in my head say oh you can have that you worked out today and that's something that I said to myself a hundred or a thousand times before and always took it as truth. Well, I worked out, so I deserve a treat. But on this particular day, partly because I was so immersed in, in the contributors to the obesity epidemic, that um, I heard it as a voice that was separate from me. And it stopped me in my tracks. And I thought, oh my God, that's not my rational brain talking because my rational brain knew about the harms of sugar, but it was coming from somewhere else. And so that's when I realized, oh my gosh, that's the sugar talking. And how is it possible that sugar is talking to me? And so I shifted away from policy and culture and did a deep dive into understanding the biology of how sugar interacts with our, our physiology and our thoughts. And um, it actually does talk to us. Um, through gut bacteria, so in your gut is good bacteria and bad bacteria, and the good bacteria feed primarily on fiber, and the bad bacteria feed on sugar and flour. And so when, those, when that bad bacteria needs to be fed, it will say anything to, to be fed, and that comes out as denial and rationalization and uh, deserving a treat, and I don't want to deprive myself, and all sorts of irrational things if you thought about it logically, but it comes through as, as truth. And so that started me, it took me two years to unravel my sugar dependency, um, but the whole time, because I teach in public health, the whole time I was figuring it out, I knew I would figure it out, and I knew I would teach people how to do it. Mm -hmm. So that started me uh, on my journey, and I created a program called Breaking Free from Sugar which over 3,500 people have successfully completed with over 96% uh, reporting that they reduced their sugar, sugar consumption and plan to continue with a sugar minimal lifestyle, which is probably one of the greatest gifts they could give themselves for their health. Cool. Let's, so addiction and sugar, those are two words that we're using and maybe want to define a little bit. Absolutely. So when we talk about sugar, what does that mean? And when we talk about addiction, Really good point. So sugar, table sugar, as we know it, is um, made up of two molecules, pretty much uh, half uh, sucrose. Table sugar is known as sucrose, which is half glucose and half fructose. Um, other sugars, uh, like high fructose corn syrup, which is found in many uh, crackers, breads, sodas, uh, is mostly fructose and is not, is is digested differently in the body than uh, sucrose is. Um, so sugar does, interacts with the body, does primar primarily does two bad things, two things to the body, 
um, that does the way it does its harm. One is insulin resistance, and the other is inflammation. Insulin resistance. Um, so when you have uh, a sugar product, um, it's it increases the amount of sugar in your blood called glucose. But too much glucose in your bloodstream is is really bad for your organs, your brain, and so we secrete insulin out of the pancreas to absorb that. Uh, really open up the cells so that the glucose can leave the bloodstream and enter the cells. Um, and as many people will have experienced, after it does its, insulin does its job of pushing the uh, glucose out of the bloodstream, there's often a lull. And so we, we get a lull in energy. Sometimes we get hangry or uh, lethargic and need another boost of uh, sugar or s refined carbohydrates to, to get that blood sugar up so we can function and have energy. But after a lifetime of doing this all day long, we build up what's called insulin resistance where the cells need more and more insulin to do the job because it's become resistant to how much it's needed to get the glucose into the blood, out of the bloodstream. That is dangerous. The insulin resistance is dangerous because it leads to prediabetes and eventually diabetes if untreated. And um, one in three Americans are prediabetic, mm -hmm. and 90% of them don't know it. Mm -hmm. So elevated blood sugar is one thing to test for. Elevated insulin is another thing to test for. Um, but so many of us are riding in that in that prediabetic range. Uh, just waiting, uh, just continuing without really realizing it um, until any number of diseases can can kick in. Yeah. The and other that's path not tied to that's not tied to body physique. It's not tied to being overweight necessarily. It's not. It really is tied to more of that insulin spike up and down. Uh, insulin resistance is is yes is specific to that function. That, um, that insulin secretion yeah. function. Um, but all that spiking is largely due to eating refined carbohydrates, yeah. sugar and refined carbohydrates. And sugar and refined carbohydrates, that, that, yeah. weight gain uh, can happen from excess calories, but it also happens when the system is not working optimally because there's too much insulin in the system because if your body can get energy it needs from blood glucose it's not going to go looking it's not going to go burning fat and insulin um, tells the body fat to hold on so it, it weight loss is a complicated thing yep. um, that is a sort of a separate conversation yep. to what's happening metabolically from having um, insulin spikes up and down yep. I guess I'm saying you, you you could have any kind of body type and still be oh yeah having this up and down insulin spike that's right that, and be pre diabetic yeah um, that's and right. so specifically I'm hearing you say like sugar mm. is what is in the bowl on your table right but it's also presenting itself in the form of carbohydrates in other ways so flours white rice crackers. Absolutely. So, um, how do you, I guess how does how does somebody identify sh sugar in their daily diet? Well, there's a spectrum. You know, there's um, added sugars, and then there's embedded sort of the sugar that's added to foods. So you can you can have a bowl of candy, and that's a clear at added sugar, but um, there are over 50 names for sugar, maybe even more than 70 names for sugar that are used in the manufacturing process. Uh, so it's really, you, to find a bread or a tomato sauce or a salad dressing without added sugar takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, even things like um, uh, chicken broth, um, bone broth that you buy um, has often added sugar, not to mention colorings often and other additives. So um, I like to take a, uh, a longer term view, sort of a harm reduction view. So the first thing that people should take out is, is the liquid sugar. Um, the liquid sugar in the form of soda 
energy drinks um, because that's just like, that just spikes the blood sugar so hard. Um, and many people say they're addicted to soda, but they're also addicted to the caffeine in the sugar, mm -hmm. in the soda. Um, so soda, liquid sugar is really the first thing that needs to go. Um, then minimizing overt treats like cookies, candies, cakes, you can minimize those. The next level might be to uh, take a closer look at the, the ingredients in the food you're buying. Um, then maybe um, minimize um, those treats to just a couple times a week or once a week. There, there definitely can be a gradual process. Um, and even once you decide to give up added sugar and do a, a detox, um, that, that takes, doing a detox is like, uh, a sugar detox is like giving up coffee. Mm -hmm. Your body just freaks out a little bit and, um, and you might feel lethargic, might have headaches, might feel um, any number of physical um, ailments associated with the body trying to pass all that out. Yeah. Um, and it does that more efficiently when there's good sleep and good exercise. So really, sugar is just one piece of a whole, uh, a whole look at lifestyle, healthy lifestyle. Um, I focused on it um, because I had my own issues with sugar, but it's really uh, one piece of, of a much larger picture of healthy lifestyle. Yeah. Um, I don't want to. I, I want to go back also to the definition of what an addiction is. Yes. And I think there's a question there that has to do with, you know, what are the signs or symbols that people could look at in themselves and say, hmm, this is an addiction. Is this a proclivity? Is this? And is there a is there a continuum of that? Yes. I'll get to that in a second. The okay. other, I just wanted to uh, wrap up the other, there are two primary pathways that sugar does its damage. One is through insulin resistance and the other is inflammation. And sugar causes uh, inflammation in the gut. And we now know that um, inflammation, particularly systemic inflammation, is connected to heart disease, connected to dysregulation of communication between the gut and the brain, may lead to dementia. Um, can lead to uh, joint pain, a anywhere systemic inflammation shows up in the body. And those, every chronic disease has as its base uh, chronic inflammation. So just to wrap up that area. Yep. Um, the question of addiction, um, there's a spectrum of addiction. Um, very similar to alcohol, there are some people's brains that treat sugar like a potent drug, and they find it very difficult to ha just have a little. So it's very often when someone realizes that they're alcoholic, they really have only one choice, and that's to go uh, cold turkey and complete abstinence. And there are some people for whom sugar acts like that on their brain and really the only choice they have is complete abstinence because having just a little creates a cascade mm -hmm. um, for multiple reasons including um, their just their brain response and it involves obsessive thinking it involves um, um, not being able to have a turn off switch um, mm -hmm. All, all sorts of behaviors specifically related to sugar addiction or food addiction, processed food addiction. But short of that, there's a huge range of, uh, of behaviors that are, that appear as addiction. So for example, uh, and I'll use myself as an example, um, I was a binger. Binging is uh, not a normal behavior. Like I would buy a bag of cookies with the intention of eating as much as, um, as much of it as I could on the drive home from the supermarket or open a bag of chips without, with the full intention of eating the bag of chips. So that kind of behavior is not um, normal in the sense that um, biologically the body shouldn't need to do that. It's not a whole food. It's not serving any caloric need. It's just an obsessive, some, some trigger went off, mm -hmm. some biological process was happening that compelled me to act in a way that was not healthful. 
other behaviors uh, other than binge. So if, if you eat a bag of cookies at a stop, that's a good sign that you might have be on this addiction spectrum. Another behavior is um, hiding food. Um, I, I kept treats in my car, in my bag, um, in my backpack that I would eat. I would, I would put it in there saying, this is for an emergency, and then I would eat it and then buy more. Um, other behaviors is, include um, eating in private, buy things or eat things that I knew nobody else was going to see that I was eating. Uh -huh. So those are all um, behaviors that might make you think, you know, maybe my relationship to sugar isn't so healthy. Maybe my relationship to processed food is not doing me any favors. Uh -huh. Even though it feels intuitively, oh, I want that, I'm gonna have that, and, it, and it, in a twisted way, it feels empowering that you can give yourself something that your body wants, but your body has been hijacked by big food that has engineered that processed food. Uh -huh. Most, everything that comes in a box or a bar have, has a barcode except, you know, blueberries that come prepackaged with the barcode, um, has been engineered. There's um, a huge industry of food engineering where they manipulate the amount of salt, sugar, and fat in every product to maximize the crunch, maximize the flavor sensation, maximize the um, the I want the, more. The I want more factor. The I want more factor. Just <laughs> bet you can't yeah. eat just one. Yeah. And they engineer it. And in fact, in the business, there's something called the bliss point, where they'll, uh, for example, with cookies, they'll take a, a young child and they'll uh, give them a sample of a, in, sh cookies with increasing amounts of sugar. And when they get to the one where they go, ooh, that's too sweet, I, I don't like that. Then they take the one just below that, and that's the bliss point, the maximum amount of sugar that can go into the product before the body rejects it. Mm. And they call that the bliss point. And all those chips, all those cookies, all the, even uh, breads are engineered with, um, or made with sugar to um, maximize the amount of hit of dopamine that we get so that we want more and more and more and more. So there's, there's um, addictive qualities built into the food that yeah. it takes a lot of uh, understanding about what's happening biologically to not buy into it. Yeah. And it's hard culturally mm. to just sort of avoid. I mean, you can read the package on everything that you buy if you buy packaged foods. But, yeah. but also there's a, a, you know, I just worked in a kitchen for a week um, where I found myself salad dressings, um, you know, preparing things that, um, you know, we make like a, you know, a vegetarian or a vegan cheese and you add sugar because it adds a certain quality mm -hmm. to the recipe yeah. as well, yeah. different than the bliss point. So let's, yeah. like, what is that? Mm. I mean, there's this whole idea of umami or, you know, the salt, sugar, the sweet factor mm -hmm. being important in culinary. What's yeah. different? What's different? between having something like a sweet element versus that bliss point or addictive sugar? I think it's a matter of degree. Okay. Um, you know, there's some, like ketchup, I think a serving of ketchup, um, a tablespoon of ketchup has a teaspoon of sugar in it. Oh. So that's a maximum amount of sugar. But they often put in, uh, add sugar, um, to commercial bread baking f to help with the browning or maybe to help with the rising mm -hmm. of it. So there might be reasons to add sugar in the manufacturing process or the food preparation process. Um, and then there are also often um, sugar added to um, spicy sauces like Thai food. Often they throw in a little bit of sugar because it offsets the spiciness. So there are culinary traditions that use uh, sugar in their cooking uh, naturally. but. Uh, or more traditionally than deliberately adding as much as possible. Uh, they do it more for flavor enhancement, um, which 
if that's all we were dealing with, that would probably be fine. It's just when you start your day with carb refined carbohydrates and then uh, have a snack and then lunch and then a snack and then more sugar yeah. at dinner, then it's that all day roller coaster with yeah. your insulin. I, it may be the sugar that's talking inside my head, but that's where I'm looking. I'm looking for that, like, do I have to give it all up yeah. at once? And I just wonder if you want to talk a little bit about what the process has been like. You talked, you, you talked about sort of the, what happens when the body detoxes. Mm. Are there folks in that 3,500 people that have done this that have found a better, a more balanced relationship with sugar? Is it, I have to give it all up for the rest of my life? That's a really great question. And in the beginning, I usually, I don't tell people they have to give it up forever. Just get through the detox because then when the cookie isn't talking to you anymore, then you can say, do I actually want it? Mm -hmm. Because once you're engaged with, oh, I want that cookie, but I can't have it, you're engaged in a dialogue with yourself over willpower. And that willpower eventually is going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think initially it took me several, two years of cycling in and out of detoxes to try and wean myself off of that dialogue, but it eventually fell away. And when you can look at a plate of cookies and it has nothing on you and you really have choice, that's a level of empowerment that I hadn't felt um, in decades. Mm -hmm. Um, I always felt like I had to control my food, and now I choose my food. Yeah. And it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. Um, so I usually tell people in the beginning, the goal is not to eliminate sugar forever. It's to cultivate a sugar minimal lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And what that means is going to be different for everybody based on their level of activity, their, what's going on biolo biologically. If you're dealing with any diagnosis, uh, anything else going on in your body, you want to reduce the how much sugar you're eating a lot because that inflammation is going to make anything worse. Mm -hmm. So particularly menopausal women, when hormones are changing, um, I, when I gave up uh, sugar, uh, when I finally got it uh, out of my system, uh, all the midlife brain fog I was experiencing just went away. Now I have crisp, clear mental clarity, consistent energy throughout the day, less joint pain, like skin cleared up, better sleep, like a whole range of midlife malaise uh -huh. um, just cleared itself up. Um, when people read through this book or what, you know, or and or go to the Create Change Lab mm. website to maybe sign up and become part of this. What are they going to find? What are they? What What is this going to offer them? Um, so I work with people in a bunch of different ways. People uh, for nineteen ninety nine can get the book, and that includes the entire Breaking Free from Sugar program. So if you're a self starter and good at DIY, then the whole recipe is right in there. Uh, for some people, and a lot of people, trying just the idea of wrapping their head around giving up sugar is so big that they want to be held by the hand and guided. And so I have a, a program called the Sweet Freedom Society, which um, has the full Breaking Free from Sugar program in it for free when you join it. And when you join the Sweet Freedom Society, um, it's a low monthly fee and there's weekly coaching there's uh, workshops, there's uh, community discussion, uh, there's some recipes, resources for parents. So there's Folks a- can see that on your website. They and can. They get to it at the Create Change. And maybe, I don't know, Kevin, you have that website, the Create Change Lab. Um, and we could bring that up to just take a look at it. Sure. Yeah. So there they can get a whole package and interact yeah. with you. Yep. And or are there other coaches? Are there other folks that are doing this work with people? There are uh, more and more. There are sugar freedom coaches. And if you, you could do a, a, an internet search to find uh, sugar. A, lo a lot of them focus on different things. Some people focus on the emotional eating piece. Some people focus on the food addiction piece. Uh, I'm not trained as someone who to dealing with food addiction. So 
for those people who feel like they might really have a food addiction, like their obsessive thoughts, that it's just beyond their ability to manage on their own, they should seek out a food addiction specialist, yeah. and there are people who do that too. So there are people who focus on different aspects uh, of, the, of the sugar dependency, food dependency spectrum. So thinking beyond the individual here mm. is, you know, we get into public health policy, mm -hmm. we get into legislation, I mean, we've seen taxes put on soda as a way of curbing um, consumption um, and or to you know take those taxes and put them back into health care to offset yep. the impacts what is your role with that and you know can you imagine a campaign against sugar or a campaign that helps us understand our relationship to sugar particularly the way there has been for tobacco or seatbelt use or alcohol I would love to see uh, federal public health dollars funneled to states to do uh, much more food education, specifically sugar education. Because in elementary schools all over the country uh, and high schools, you find uh, posters that say, don't smoke, don't vape, don't do drugs, don't drink alcohol because they all affect your brain. Well, sugar affects the growing brain also and sets up habits that um, become very difficult to unwind as people, as children grow. So I think more public awareness about the challenge and the harmfulness of sugar needs to be out there because there is no counter information right now. Most people are severely undereducated about basic nutrition things and they think having a treat once in a while is fine and it may be fine if it's not on top of a sugary breakfast, a carbohydrate laden lunch, a carb laden dinner. So I mean is the is the industry of sugar making this much money? I mean Yeah. Um, I mean, is that why? I mean why why is there sugar in everything? That's a longer story. Okay. Um, and yeah, and we only have a few minutes left. The short yeah. answer is everything spikes after World War II. Um, after World War II, there were policy changes that um, had us growing more corn that was turned into high fructose corn syrup that increased the amount of soda. It was a cheap ingredient for soda companies. Um, we increased use of gliophosphate and how that might be disrupting um, generations of microbiome. Um, there are... Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, the, I mean, the, the, just the industry around sugar yeah. as a particular thing. Yeah, so because it affects people individually and people have their sweet treats and because it's a sugar, there is a sugar industrial complex, there is a, a huge amount of business that is uh, run and manufactured that's tied to farming, that's tied to international policy. Legislating sugar is a long road and likely it takes a, it would take a huge amount of political will for a legislator to propose national regulations around sugar. Yeah. The fact that the new, uh, they're a couple years old now, uh, the new nutrition facts label has an, a line for added sugar is a huge boon for public health. And the fact that that happened is just a miracle. Um, and I think we likely have to um, thank the Obama administration for pushing that through yeah. or marshalling, uh, showing leadership in that area. Yeah. Um, so there's a huge amount of policy opportunity. Uh, I'm keeping my eye on what's happening internationally. Several countries are trying to legislate labeling of sugar-laden products. Um, Mexico has a, a warning label on uh, sugary foods that have over a certain percentage of sugar. Uh, that would be really hard to fly in the U.S., but I think there are a whole bunch of other policy initiatives, like we could eliminate um, eliminate advertising to sugary foods at on Saturday morning shows that are aimed at kids. Yeah. Um, that should be an easy win. Just like we took off uh, tobacco off of on-air television, we should take off sugary foods that are aimed at kids. 
Um, other policy initiatives look at could look at um, the Farm Bill and the food assistance programs. There are three major food assistance programs that come out of the Farm Bill, uh, the WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children, the SNAP, uh, food assistance, also known as uh, formerly known as food stamps, uh, and also the school uh, did I say that? the school food nutrition yeah. program. Yeah. Uh, all of those programs are laden with sugar. Yeah. Um, you can use your food stamp dollars, your SNAP dollars, to buy uh, soda, and I think that should absolutely be eliminated because we're encouraging people to buy soda that hurts their health. That uh -huh. then comes back to harm the country because we've lost the productivity of a person who and and aspirations of a person because they have to deal with illness yeah. so uh, there are lots of policy uh, yeah. initiatives that could help yeah and you know we're coming to a close and I have to say like the, almost the entire time we're talking I'm picturing a birthday cake <laughs> in my head which just makes me think you know that the you know as you said the gut has these these connections to the brain and our brain is sort of in our gut as well, which makes me wonder about this. And I wonder if you can leave us on a note of something that you've done that you feel like is, you know, you've, you've, you know, beyond that, like being able to have a freedom relationship with a plate of cookies, but what's a way that you celebrate that doesn't include sugar in your life? Um, um. So I'll answer that and then I want to leave people with some tips yeah, for great. Awesome. reducing their sugar. Yeah. Um, one of the things that comes up when I suggest that people uh, reduce how much sugar they eat, their first reaction is, oh, I don't want to be deprived. But if you take away the chocolate or the cookies, the primary source of easy dopamine, of easy hits of pleasure, of course you're going to be deprived. So a primary strategy is to increase other forms of pleasure. Our bodies are sensory pleasure machines. And uh, engaging in conversation, uh, stepping outside on a, on a beautiful day, even a damp, cold, rainy day, it gives a, our skin sensation and our noses and our eyes things to feast on. So increasing the amount of pleasure that you get from other things will resensitize your pleasure center and not uh, detrain it, retrain it from needing the big hit uh, to know that, okay, this is, uh, I'm getting my pleasure now. And, you eventually find pleasure everywhere, which intersects with gratitude and being happy and content, which is self-perpetuating. Because if you can step outside on a rainy day and say, oh, what a beautiful rain, even in Vermont this summer, that's mm -hmm. a little rough, um, then you know you're well on your way to healing that um, extra chemical stimulation that you've needed for pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, on a more practical sense, um, I can't imagine um, a celebration that wouldn't be wonderfully, where people wouldn't be beautifully happy with um, blueberries and whipped cream. Yeah. Um, that pretty much gets you your, your sweet, your fat, your, uh, your, your a little bit of protein. It gets everything all in, in one. Uh, so there are healthful ways, healthful ways to celebrate. Um, without cake, right. birthday cake. Yeah. Uh, so, and I did want to end with yeah. some tips. Yeah. Um, so the the biggest tip that I offer people in my program is start your day uh, with a savory breakfast. So um, no refined carbohydrates if possible. So that means eggs, sausage. If you're vegan, um, you could do it with um, tofu scramble or something with chickpeas or uh, tempeh. Uh, you just want to minimize your carbohydrates because then you're going to minimize your your insulin fluctuation. And insulin, insulin fluctuations are one of the key drivers of cravings. Uh, another uh, another um, major uh, or two major things that go together are uh, water consumption, uh, electrolyte balancing, making sure you're getting um, minerals, so maybe adding a pinch of sea salt to your water bottle um, can just help keep you hydrated and help eliminate some of the um, tendencies for people to um, eat something when they're actually thirsty. Uh, 
what, keeping an eye on your sleep. Um, there's uh, good research to show that um, the less sleep you get, the more likely you are to overeat. I think that's because your body is trying to keep the energy going mm -hmm. when it didn't get enough sleep and energy. Um, and sleep is also when your brain detoxes. So if you're not sleeping enough, your body is not processing out um, not only the sugar residues, um, but all the other toxicity uh, that you've built up through the day by living in an urban environment or taking in uh, toxins that we're not aware of. Um, another good thing is to keep moving. Um, because the muscles are um, the primary driver of metabolism and if your metabolism is cranking and doing well then uh, you're less likely to rely on treats for energy because your, your muscles will be maintaining your energy uh, levels throughout the day uh, by burning up stored glucose. Um, what else? Um, Strengthen your microbiome, your gut, by eating lots of vegetables uh, and fermented foods. One of the, uh, it's one of the things that I emphasize in my program is you want to build up the good bacteria in the gut. So uh, fibrous vegetables, um, broccoli, cauliflower, all the zucchinis, collards, um, any, all the fibrous vegetables will st strengthen the colony of good bacteria in your gut. And you can even uh, enhance that by having fermented foods like kimchi, sauerkraut, miso, uh, yogurt, and kefir um, are all ways to help build up a healthy microbiome. Well, Dr. Andrew Grayson, thank you so much You're for so joining us. This was a lot less scary than I thought. <laughs> I will say, just to Glad share to with it. folks, yeah, and um, appreciate you all watching. Um, you're watching Town Meeting Television, and if you caught this on television, you can also catch us on Town Meeting TV backslash, no, YouTube.com backslash Town Meeting TV um, or CH17.TV. Thanks.